Let's start with antennas. An antenna is a device that transmits or receives electromagnetic waves and uh, they're often referred to as radio waves. Most antennas are resonant devices, which means the size of the antenna is made to be compatible with the length of the frequency. Each frequency of radio waves has a, a, um, a length, wave length. A wavelength is the distance from any peak to the next peak of a sinusoidal waveform or any trough to the next trough of a sinusoidal waveform or any given point to the next corresponding equivalent given point on a sinusoidal waveform. And so there's a wavelength and if I want to make an antenna that receives a specific radio frequency wave then I have to construct my antenna to the length of that wave or a fra uh, an equivalent fraction thereof because some waves are too long. This antenna here is a Yagi antenna and a Yagi antenna is used most most often in VHF or UHF frequencies. <clears throat> Basically it consists of a uh, what we call the feeder or the driven element and there's two wires coming off of this that is actually where your signal is fed down to your television or your radio. We have a signal uh, element in the back and that's a reflector so that means when the signal comes in from this way it reflects back to the driven element. We have directors and these signal these two sort of focus the signal onto the driven element and that's the Yagi. Um, very common in television reception. But there's many different kinds of antennas like your rabbit ears that you have on top of your TV. They're a basic uh, two element reception uh, Yagi antenna without a director or without a uh, reflector. And you can adjust the length to be a fraction of your station you're wanting to receive where it's of a relationship to your wavelength. But there's more than different kinds of antennas. For instance, and there's something we need to talk about, about like horizontal and vertical polarization. Vertical polarization means the wave of the RF signal is polarized either horizontally or vertically. AM radio is usually vertical polarization. That means the wave is traveling up and down. A television or FM signal is horizontally polarized usually, which means that's going to the right and the left. And so <clears throat> when I design my antenna, I have to design it with respect to the polarization of the signal. The earliest antennas were just a real long wire. And the longer the wire, the more stuff you'd pick up, the more signal you had. Early AM radio, just string a wire between two trees or two poles or whatever. Here is an example of a vertically polarized antenna right there. Here's an example of a horizontally polarized Yagi antenna. Here is a satellite antenna. It works with microwaves and the microwaves are so small that they all come in from space and then they're reflected off this dish to a focus point here where the receiver is. So you have to design your antenna to work with the type of radio signal that you're going to be receiving or transmitting. <clears throat> Let's talk about David Sarnoff. Uh, David Sarnoff was a Russian who became an American businessman and the pioneer of a commercial radio and television. He founded National Broadcasting Company and uh, also he led the Radio Corporation of America and uh, he also um, was in various capacities he was the main uh, driver or business driver of the radio model in the United States and everywhere through the world for that matter. He, uh, he came up with a law, the Sarnoff's law, that said uh, the value of any broadcast network is proportional to the number of view your viewers. You know, he didn't really care about quality as much. He did to an extent. He wanted to have this broadcasting empire. He wanted, he said, the more people you have listening to your network, the more valuable it is for advertising. <clears throat> 
his network was RCA. Now this is very interesting. The United States disallowed all the patents of the German brands for broadcasting. And so, in effect, the United States said, we're going to take over all these patents for radio in the United States. And the government made a rate, all radio manufacturing companies and broadcast companies and everything related to radio a part of the war effort. So that means, any transmitting facilities, any, any manufacturers of receivers, whatever, <clears throat> that came under the war effort. They considered it valuable for the war. After the war, they had to do something with that monopoly that the government had created. Well, somehow or another, uh, that all turned over to GE, and then GE gave it all mostly 90% or 80% to David Sarnoff. So the government came in during the war and made a big conglomerate out of everything radio, and then they turned it over to GE, then it turned over somehow through lobbying or something to David Sarnoff. Sarnoff ended up with a big conglomerate of radio. RCA became the powerhouse starting in 1920 with the creation of NBC. <clears throat> Sarnoff was real good at manipulating the U.S. government. He had a lot of lobbyists in place, he had a lot of money in place, and he could get the government to do what he wanted. And so he would manipulate the government through legislation to hinder his competition. All right? And so that, that led to a lot of legal battles between NBC and RCA and things like CBS or other people that made radios or anything like that. Um, he was ruthless in trying to get rid of any competition. Now, let me go back then, and we're going to come back to this in a little bit. Let's go back to Armstrong, the inventor of FM. We're back right there. Edwin Howard, Howard Armstrong, he was a brilliant inventor, scientist. He invented FM. Well, what happened was he came up with this FM system that was far superior to the broadcast quality of AM. As a matter of fact, he was working for Sarnoff for a little while, and Sarnoff said to him, can you make me radio that doesn't have noise? So what happens is Armstrong made FM, but FM was too big of a departure from the business model that Sarnoff wanted for radio. It made high fidelity, perfect quality audio. And so that was too much work for Sarnoff. He didn't want to do that. So what happened was Armstrong said, well, this is a great radio system. So what he did was he went and started, he had, some, he had a good amount of money and from his patents and so forth. So he went and started his own broadcast company. And he started his broadcast company with uh, FM transmitters and he had a company that made FM receivers. So he was selling FM receivers and he was licensing FM transmitters. But what he did was he put FM at lower frequencies of the RF spectrum. So that means his FM signal, which was high fidelity, which means it was equivalent or better than the sound that the human ear could hear, would also, from a transmitter, go anywhere in the world because of the reflection off the ionosphere. So what happened was Armstrong started selling these radios that had perfect sound, and if you had one transmitter in New York, you could hear that perfect sound off that radio in Los Angeles or anywhere in the world. So he came up with this system. Well, it was getting quite popular, um, very popular. And, and Sarnoff could see <clears throat> this taking business away from his AM radio business model. And, you know, because it, even back in the 1930s, it was the same quality you could have off a of, uh, LP album. Perfect frequency, perfect sound, beautiful. It's almost CD quality today would, would not get that close. 
But what happened was Sarnoff determined that this wasn't going to be allowed to happen because everybody was starting to move over to the Armstrong radios, which worked so much better and all that. So what Sarnoff did was he went to the federal government and he lobbied them and he paid off congressmen. And so all of a sudden, after thousands of these FM transmitters were sold and about 40 FM stations were existing to broadcast in this system, all of a sudden the federal government came in and said you can't broadcast FM below a certain frequency. And so that made it illegal to broadcast. And so all of a sudden all these FM radio stations that were broadcasting Armstrong, the Armstrong design, they were closed down. They actually physically came in and closed them down. And all the people that had bought these receivers, they were useless. And so that eliminated FM radio that could travel all the way around the world and be received perfectly. In addition to that, Sarnoff owned uh, RCA Records, and which, which they had the RIAA, the Recording Industry of America. And the bad part about FM was when you had an old AM radio signal, it didn't sound good. Low fidelity, noise, not that great. You could hear it, but it wasn't that great. If you wanted to hear the music as good as it could be, you had to go buy a record album. FM, as, as Armstrong invented it, made it where you could hear the music without having to buy the album. So they came in and made more legislation that the audio quality broadcast on any transmitter in the United States, especially FM, could never be the same quality of sound as uh, your record you could buy. And here's what, here's what the standards were. <clears throat> the limitation with FM, so what, the, what has he done? They moved FM up to 88 to 108 megahertz, which means it's all line of sight, so you can never have an FM signal go past maybe 100 miles. And even though the human hearing range is from 20 to 20,000 hertz, okay, that's hi-fi. That's, that's how good your ear hurt, your ear can hear. They mandated that in the United States that an FM radio station would be limited to a hundred <coughs> to around um, 15,000. So what we've done is we've taken a hi-fi signal, we made it okay but it's not near as good as it should be. So they mandated that the quality, the quality would be reduced. And in reality, in FM broadcasts today, they're going from about 500 to about maybe oh, 13,000. And so the, he, he mandated, he made the federal government mandate that you can never have an FM broadcast produce an audio signal that would compete with an LP album. That's what Sarnoff did. His model was how can we make money off this network? How can we make money off these records? And when Armstrong came in with a better system that would work all over the world, he got the US government to stop it. And, um, and, he, and so that, that caused a long legal battle between RCA and Armstrong. And so what Sarnoff and RCA resolved to do was to keep Armstrong tied up in court. And RCA had a lot of money, uh, Sarnoff had a lot of money, and he had lawyers, he had a lot of lawyers. And so what he did was he made sure that Armstrong was in court almost all the time. He couldn't even go out of the country, couldn't even go out of the city, because he was always being called into court to fight this legal battle over this system. So he spent years in court and weeks 
in, you know, in, in an entire month, he'd be living in a hotel near the court and going to court to defend his system because RCA just kept attacking him and attacking him and attacking him with legal battles. And eventually, he couldn't take it anymore. Uh, he got angry, he got mad, he hit his wife. She loved him, they loved, he loved her, but he just lost it. And he couldn't deal with that anymore, so he had an apartment in New York. He pulled the air conditioner, it's the 1950s. He pulled the air conditioning unit out of the window and he put on all of his clothes, like a big coat and everything, and jumped out, the window, out of the window and killed himself as a result of this attack by Sarnoff on Armstrong. Well, what happened was when uh, Sarnoff heard that he had committed suicide, the first thing he said to all the press was, I didn't kill Armstrong. <clears throat> My answer would be, if you didn't, who did? But he was the cause of this guy committing suicide. Well, uh, that's, that's my opinion. Lots of people would disagree. Um, after he died, his wife kept up the legal battle. And many years later, finally it was proven scientifically that Armstrong was correct and that he did own the patents to these systems. That was far too late for him, but his wife managed to get a good amount of money off of it. Okay, um, let's go on back and look at Sarnoff. But you know, sometimes you have to have a Sarnoff to make a, um, a, um, a business really grow big, because he was, the absolute perfect business predator. He was going to make sure his business was on top of everything and do everything to destroy everything that could possibly be competition. Um, and he was successful at it. And, arms, and RCA was a powerhouse up until the 60s. And, and in 1970, Sarnoff died at an old age. But he died in 1971, but he turned his um, his, the business of RCA over to his son Robert in 1970. And what happened was um, his son Robert, uh, after Sarnoff died, decided to sell it all off, make, quick, make a quick buck. And so he sold off RCA to French and German companies uh, like Thompson and so forth. And uh, they were mismanaging. And once Sarnoff died, the management was so poor that it was starting to really go downhill anyway, and once he got older. And so even though RCA <coughs> was a big powerhouse for job creation, uh, after Sarnoff died, it was just all sold off to foreign companies and that was the end of RCA.